We're talking about the assembly yesterday where some huge votes happened for the club future. But before we do that, let's head back real quick. Again, this is for the fun part of the show. Let's head back to fantasy land for a second. Unsurprisingly, if you look at the timing of the rumors, just about 24 hours before the assembly convened, some semi-reliable sources reported that Barca had the inside track on signing Sevilla's Jules Conde, taking him away from the likes of Chelsea and you know all the other clubs with uh, a ton of cash. So I'm not so sure about that as far as the rumor. So instead, we're going to stay just in fantasy land, pretend that it's all real. I did put out a poll yesterday. If for 60 million euros, that's all you have, 60 million euros in this hypothetical world, you'd rather sign Lewandowski and Koulibaly or just Jules Koundé. And to me, not to give away the, the end of the poll, but the Lua Koulibaly combo dominated the vote. But I tend to be on the other side of that. Where would you land? I would go with Lua Koulibaly. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's, that's not even close. That's not even something that I need to think about. Um, I like Kunde because of his um, uh, both his physical uh, and his technical attributes. Um, I have questions regarding his mental uh, fortitude and whether he's really ready to uh, to take that step and not only join a big club because I'm pretty sure that he can join a big club, but to actually um, become an elite center back at an elite club. Um, because it, like at this level, often it's mentality what sets people apart. And um, what, what I've seen from Jules Koundé this season, I don't know if something is going on with him off the pitch. Mm-hmm. But it just seemed as if something was off. Um, the best example of this would be uh, when he got rattled by Jordi Alba. Like, of all players, you're going to let Jordi Alba get under your skin? Really? Um, and that there were there were some other instances when I saw him at Sevilla this, this season, like, mm, almost like I start to think, like, well, did his grandmother die? Like, you know, something, like, really going on in this guy's life, which, who knows? Yeah. Right? What is true is that he was better last season than he was this previous season. As in, when he was 22, he was better than he's still just 23. So I agree. He is one of those that is really, really, really knocking on the door and pushing the envelope as to being in that elite class of center backs. And you know me, I dug into the numbers here because, I mean, when you talk about perfect fits, I'm not saying that Lewandowski, people heard me before. I think Lewandowski, I'm not one of those naysaying that deal because for the right price, certainly for the right weight wages for two years plus, he bangs in 30 plus goals for you and he wins titles. That's what Lewandowski does. So obviously I'm not denying Lewandowski would be a great fit, but for Kunde, you know, the numbers say his progressive passing and dribbling is very much like Eric Garcia's Garcia is slightly better on distance per, uh, per pass and passes under pressure, but that also has a lot to do with the matches themselves and those margins and the style of play between Barcelona and Sevilla. But Kunde does more when he gets in the final third as well, in terms of his key passes, in terms of uh, his passes that create scoring opportunities. And then in comparison to Araujo with defensive metrics, he has a similar number of blocks, more combined tackles plus interceptions and tackling being a category that Araujo led by 11 and his tackling percentage, that being Kunde's of 63 is lower than Araujo's 77% but way, way higher than Garcia's. This one was almost laughable. Garcia's 37% as far as tackling percentage. And for context there, Liverpool's Virgil van Dijk is at 73%. Pau Torres of Villarreal is at 52%. And David Alaba is at 56%. So you can see there, Kunde is somewhere in the middle of the elite tacklers and really highly rated defenders who are also burdened with being good passers. So the, the where, where did you pull those stats? Um, they were from uh, RB Ref, which is usually what... I trust with those kind of percentages and percentiles and things like that. RB ref. Yeah, I can say we, we, I can send it to you. Uh, I, no, cause I use F ref and it sounds so similar. I think I'm using that site and I'm mispronouncing it. So okay. I was so, I so inundated in the uh, assembly numbers that yeah, I, I didn't check the website, but yeah. So those are the, the kind of advanced metrics that I was looking for in terms of just to see if, cause I agreed with you. I thought he was way better last year than he was this year. And to me, you're right. That's the whole thing that, if, if, you were, if you're telling me or promising me that Kunde at 23 
can break through through Barcelona, through Xavi, can break through whatever plagued him last season, and you're getting the best version of that player, that's the player I want. But certainly, if Koundé continues to struggle, then not to say you're going to have another Langley situation, but clearly Langley was really good for Sevilla, came to Barcelona, it didn't work out, it didn't work out. So if there is any truth to any of the Koundé stuff, though, this will not be the last we hear of it or discuss it. So we're going to move on here now, Levon, to the main course. But really, you know, we're really only moving on to the vegetables, honestly, because we don't, you know, you don't want to eat them, but it's for your health. So you have to, you have to swallow all the financial stuff. I really appreciate it. I like vegetables. <laughs> well, no, nah, I mean, not everyone. I'm talking about your children. <laughs> not not, not I mean, you, the adult. I'm, I'm not American. I'm okay with vegetables. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I certainly, at least, well, I actually do like my vegetables too, but I'm just, I'm just teasing you. Man. I'm not, uh, I'm not one word that I I'm tired of is the word lever. I think I've had enough of that for the last week. Um, so I'm going to try not to use that word instead. We're going to say that yesterday at the assembly, Barca members that were eligible to vote authorized the sale 49.9% stake in Barca licensing and merchandising, which furthermore, Barca, uh, Levon and I will be calling BLM, but it is Barca licensing and merchandising. The club then can claim a sale. Uh, the club did claim that the sale could bring in 200 million euros to 300 million euros in that window. And the vote wound up being 568 voted in favor, 65 against, and 13 abstained. And then became the uh, then came next the authorization of the stake of up to 25% of the club's TV rights from the Liga, that is just a Liga, for up to 25 years. Uh, Barca said that each 10% could bring in about 10 million, uh, sorry, 10 million, 200 million euros or up to 500 million euros potentially at the highest number for that. Mm. 100, well, I, I, let me finish here. 494 voting members were in favor, just 62 against. And, you know, so translate, do you, not only can you add more to this, Levon, but also translate, you know, prior to that vote, you felt like socios didn't have the full picture before voting. And even in that explanation that I just gave you that came from people, journalists who were there, there were things missing, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but, but, but this is the same that we talked about last time and people are still not asking the key, the key question. What exactly do we need the money for? What happens when we don't have that money? Um, you know, do, I imagine we need some money to, to pay all of the deferred wages. For example, I imagine we need some money uh, to pay um, all of the transfer fees that are due and that have been piling up. Um, some of it is due to the uh, to accounting, where um, there there is a higher deficit because of also what we discussed last time that we talked uh, the 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 case uh, the court case trials, the court cases that are against us. Uh, sorry for the stutter. Um, the um, uh, devalu devaluation of Pjanic and Umtiti and uh, Roberto Neto uh, and, 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 and Coutinho. Um, but we still don't know what would have happened if we did not get the money. Now they're talking about um, a minimum of 200 million per 10% of TV rights. So that would be a minimum of 500 uh, and a minimum of 200 for BLM, uh, which is 700. That could go up seven to eight, 900 million. Um, they're also, and I think this is, this came from COPE. Uh, they're also talking that we're planning on uh, spending 200 million on the transfer market this season, which I guess, yeah, if you have 800 million coming in, then you're going to use some of this. Uh, I don't know if that would be 200 million uh, net or 200 million um, with or without taking into account all of the all of the player sales that might be happening. We might still sell Frankie de Jong, for example. Um, but yeah, I mean, I am not much wiser before the assembly, then after the assembly, other than um, there is a whole lot of money coming in this season. And if that money is coming in, then um, we will have less income over the next 25 years. One, one of the things that I do think is interesting is the 25% of uh, TV income only represents about 5% of the total income. 
it's obviously not all of our TV income. It's La Liga TV income, not the TV income from European football, uh, which is also a whole lot of money if we do well. Yeah, I mean, that that last little part of that sentence you said, I think, is the most important thing where there it sounds like I mean, this was the quick pitch. It sounds like Barca will now be active this summer in the transfer window because of the 800 million that's coming in. But since, you know, nothing good happens without a repercussion, it's totally fair to ask. The repercussions are, are likely, unfortunately, though, for this very still unknown, because not only are these deals even these de- like I know that there's a, a big variance in the number that Laporta is almost saying he's promising, but these deals, even if something is already in place, right, like the, it's in place to then be activated once it was approved, that's fair. But these deals obviously have not been done yet. So Laporta had to have them approved first, obviously. So again, not only are they not done, but we don't know the actual figures both now and in the future. And Mm -hmm. in the future part of that, again, the variance of these deals is that so much of this calculation is that this is based on Barcelona winning, having success. And the difference between second and third in the Liga for these TV rights deals matters. The difference between getting to the quarterfinals of the Champions League. Well, that's the, those are some of the big ones. The quarterfinals, to the final even, not even winning it, but getting to the final as opposed to getting kicked out of the quarterfinal or God forbid, at the group stage again, right? Yeah. Like the, the difference in that money is millions of euros and the difference yeah. between some of these deals. So I, I do, so, yeah. Let, let, let me quickly jump in there and explain how the Liga TV deal works. Um, 50% of the total TV deal gets uh, shared equally among all the clubs. 25% uh, is um, because of the ranking, where you end. And then another 25% is linked to, to the social mass. How many fans actually watch your matches? So whether we finish second or third, it, it matters. But it does not matter all that much, especially because like people usually finish in the top three. Yeah, I mean, you know, the only little pushback I have just just a bit is it's about, I think, the this abstract success. Like, again, like coming from it from, you know, related to Barca slash business side of things, like second and third in the table and playing well or not playing well. And the, even the number of points, if, if second and third are separated by eight points, that was eight points of lost revenue. That's eight points of, of fans not showing up to the camp, no, or not, um, or, or not going to the museum or not mm-hmm. basically just not providing Barcelona that extra bit of revenue that success garners. I, I think that's really what I mean by the difference between second and third. Is that like that extra bit of playing well, that extra bit of success that if, if they're challenging for the Liga is different than comfortably being in third because yeah. Barca fans are so demanding that like they, they bring in revenue when the team is flying at its highest. So I, I do also want to thank Pedro and Mike really helped me out with both the, the BLM stuff and the TV rights deal. So to add to what you're saying, like, again, first, we're solely talking about the La Liga TV rights, uh, the Champions League is separate. So due to the nature of this, also due to the nature of this deal being very an upfront deal, we're basically, again, in layman's terms, we're replacing our short term debt payments, whether, as you said, it's deferred payments um, from or salaries or, again, it's still, I believe, still paying Liverpool for Coutinho. Like, it's like eight mm-hmm. million or ten, right? Like, he's technically paid off on the bar side, but still Liverpool, but... So those short-term payment uh, debt payments, which remember the primary issue, as I've said for weeks now, with an obligation to share a portion of the TV rights moving forward. So, but we know the short-term benefits, though. That's the other thing here. It helps Barca out of trouble with the La Liga salary limits, and it helps them out of trouble with fair play this se- this coming season. But how much this deal helps or hurts Barca in the long run is what is again still very much unknown. And it, Mike's these are Mike's words. If we get good terms. And we make smart investments in the squad that leads to success on the field, which means increased revenue, then it was a good decision. But if we make stupid transfer decisions or get bad terms on the deal, then it was really dumb. So yeah, yes, I mean is, that that is well, that, everything. That, that that is obvious, right? Now I think there's another layer to this though. So one thing we need to increase our income. Uh, and of course, to increase our income, uh, we need to play well. Um, but but the other thing is what does this actually do right now imagine that we spend 200 million on incoming players regardless of whether that is uh or whether those 200 million includes the money we earn from selling players or even or if it's on top of it sure 
but we spent 200 million on people coming in. Do you think that Jordi Alba, um, Sergio Busquets, and Pique are going to tell the club, yeah, no, it's okay. We can, uh, you can cut our salaries in half if they see us spend 200 million on the market? Hell no. Like, why, 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 why would they? That is insane. Um, the, also, if we spend 200 million, then next summer, those 200 million uh, would already be uh, an extra 40 million in, in amortization on all of the transfer deals on top of all of the salaries that that includes because the more that you spend on a player, the, the higher the salary is going to be. Mm-hmm. Yep. So um, my, my big concern about spend, spending a lot of money on the transfer market right now is not even the expenditure of that money. It's what the expenditure of that money does in, um, in the big picture. H- how this impacts the rest of the team, how this impacts us uh, next summer. Like it makes no sense now selling off five percent of our total income for the next 25 years if next summer we have to sell off another five percent just to sign again yeah so that 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 would be my concern and that is uh where we really need to trust the board that they really have a plan and they really know what they're doing well yeah to add to that right like you you also called it here that I've, i've heard you've heard some people call for hey we need to terminate the contracts of, of the guys who don't want to leave, like Langley, Brathway, Titi. They terminate those deals. But when you look at the wage structure for the team, because remember, like the transfer fees you get for Langley, that what it's going to be, eight million or twelve million. I, I'm not sure what even the market they're, is. For they're Langley. talking about loaning them out. Well, exactly. So I'm not sure exactly what even the transfer fee would be, but you'd assume of a player still quote unquote age wise in his prime, you'd get somewhere between eight and 15. You'd assume mm-hmm. for a player like Langley. Um, and then for MTT, it might even be lower because you have no sample size. But if you terminate even the contract of Umtiti, like problematically, there's three and a half Umtitis as far as weekly wages are Busquets, who's the highest earner at the club. And you're talking a very similar number to, to Alba as well. So as, as you mentioned, like terminating even Brothwaite, right? Brothwaite reportedly makes about 115,000 plus per week euros. But Alba makes around 400,000 weekly gross per, per week. So, I mean, you're talking about almost four times, you know, Alba for Brothwaite, right? And Alba, however, you have to argue last season, obviously did four times more what Brothwaite did last year, right? So you, in theory, you're terminating Brothwaite's deal, not to balance your books, but to kind of say, okay, these are the problems we can fix right now, terminating some of these contracts. And as far as Busquets, Abba, and PK, looking at not only their deferred wages from before, but even what you currently owe them, not talking about their deferred wages, you're talking about the problem, right? That is what it is. And you know now we're doing that thing again, where it becomes opinion, where people bring up, well, Carlos Puyol, he deferred a lot of his salary and he never paid it back. But again, he also went right into being an agent and was given agent commissions. And there's other things that were going on with PK, with, uh, with PK. <laughs> of course, with PK, there's other things always financially going on. But with, <laughs> so with Puyol, I mean, there was already levers also set up for him, whether the club was helping him out with that, with those ambassador roles or sponsorships or whatever it was. But, you know, you're, you're having a, a subset of the fan base arguing Puyol, Xavi and Iniesta, they seem to do this right. Obviously, we never had to worry if Messi did it right or not, because that was taken from him and us. And then you have Busquets, Alba, and Pique, right? The last of that generation, if you will. I mean, even Danny Alves, right, did it the exact right way. He was forced out by the club, and then he returned for his little swan song. And even now, he said, okay, fine. Uh, The club doesn't necessarily want me to come back, so I'm going to part ultimately forever at 39, and that's it. But those three, Pique, Busquets, and Alba, are going to continue to be the problem, even though they're valuable, they're valuable to this squad this coming season. But as we've talked about many, many times, their number, their num- and again, that's a Busquets thing, right? His number is the problem. Him mm-hmm. as a player is not the problem. He is a starter for Barcelona in 2022-2023. Sorry. <laughs> he, had, he played mm-hmm. more than everyone else. He was essential to the way Xavi wants to play. But he also makes, again, four times what the likes of Sergio Dest and so many of those other, the, the, or uh, even Araujo. Araujo makes 134,000. And Alba makes 400,000. And 
So, so I mean, and why would De Young be sold? De Young is fourth in that ledger. Once Dembele leaves, he'll be third with three hundred and seven thousand. So that's why you get rid of Frankie De Young because Kessier is going to come on a third of that. And so, if Kessier can give you ninety percent of what Frankie De Young gave you, obviously that's why you sell Frankie De Young. It's it's right. that's why I go back to it. Frankie De Young, you can argue that it's about the stuff on the field, but it's eighty percent, ninety percent financial still, even if it comes down to that metric. I I don't know because if 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 the, during the last three years. Uh, Frank and Young at Barcelona consistently plays at his highest level. Then I don't know if we're selling him. Like honestly, uh, so I, I so I, th- I don't know. So I, so I think I it is. Both. Because I think it is both. But what, but I don't know because Ansu is going to be making like two hundred and twenty thousand per week, and his contract was just renegotiated. And Pedri's at around 180, 190. So regardless of that, in two years' time, when Busquets and Alba are gone, and obviously Dembele is walking now. Frank de Young is still going to be the albatross because he's still got five years on that deal. His number is still going to be the albatross in the salary structure. So you're, you're down this path where if things go wrong, like if the club doesn't have the success we're talking about with this gamble on these two deals, then you're going to re- need to renegotiate Frank de Young. He's going to be mm-hmm. the guy that's going to be the issue when that's going to continue to push up against those the league of salary limits. So if anything, I, I truly believe the club is saying, I mean, I agree with you, right. If he was totally untouchable, if he was the best player on the team, that he would be worth that number. But you're definitely careening on this path that says Frankie's going to make 100,000 euros a week more than six players, or not six, that's too many, three or four players that are better than he is or more essential to the team than he is. Yeah, I mean, we're not even sure where he ranks in, in the midfield after Petri. Is he our second best midfielder? Is th- our third best midfielder? With Gavi breaking through, will he, is he going to be our fourth best midfielder? Like that is an open debate. I, I heard the I heard the uh, the stomps of the Pablo Torre bandwagon starting to they're, they're starting oh. to grab the engine. <laughs> and, 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 a, and a lot of people are very excited about him. I'm I'm excited about seeing him just because correct <laughs> just because of how excited other people are about this kid. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, an, another thing I want to share with you. I think I finally understand why uh, um, why keeping uh, Sergio Roberto and putting him on five million uh, for his last year is actually a good deal for us. Like, it finally makes sense because the amount of deferred payments that were due were higher than the deal that we finally gave him. Mm-hmm. So that's how we're save, actually saving money on that deal, even though we could have let his contract run out. Mm-hmm. But if we let his contract run out, we, do, we would have still owed him all of the money we had not paid yet. That makes sense to me. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, yeah, that makes sense to me. Like, so, it, I think you solved it, cracked the code. It, it, it was like a huge uh, eureka moment for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's not only why you're on the show, but yeah, that, that's a great note. And then... Uh, to, just to go back to the, the assembly real quick, the, two, the, the other deal that we hadn't spoken about with the BLM is another note from Patreon. Mike, again, really helped me out with this stuff. He's a finance guy and uh, helped me straighten all this stuff out. So huge credit for him for doing my homework for me. But he's actually not that worried about the licensing and marketing sale based on the numbers in the last annual report, which said that mm-hmm. BLM is only responsible for about 8% of the club's revenue, which is uh, in total, 44 million euros in June of 2020, and then 4%, this is largely due to the p- pandemic, but 4% then in June of 2021 at just 24 million euros. So obviously all that was affected by the pandemic, sure. But the report also said that it brought in 263,000 euros in profit in 2020 and a loss of 8 million euros in 2021, again, due to the pandemic. But there is a silver lining here where due to that deal, Barca hands over a part of their business that they aren't necessarily very good at to a third party who actually makes waves with it. The part of the deal, like, so this is actually a a deal that being the BLM much more than the TV rights that has a high percentage of actually working out great for Barca. Again, as long as they Mm -hmm. use those funds in proper ways. And again, if they work with the right partner, then they could come out on the other side of this doing pretty well. And that was pretty, I agree. Yeah. Especially for people in the U S and if you're in the U S or you're in Japan or one of those markets that Barca's, still trying to figure out how to put a licensing and marketing foothold in that's yeah and i, I i'm optimistic especially with the world cup mm-hmm. here in 2026 right like these are the kind of things where i mean this deal is going to probably be about 10 years is what you've heard right somewhere in there five to ten years like so you got enough time to rev up and do a soft landing here in the us for the world cup in 2026 
and yeah. and and make more than than that bread certainly so absolutely that, that most, of, most of the income there is local we don't have to uh, we don't right. have to know how so we're not just looking for a partner who says hey you know um it's, it's not going to be a silent partner who just puts up money and expects part of the income that's not what the club is looking for they're actually looking for a partner who helps it grow now I heard that the revenue was 55, not 40 something. Uh, but but even if it's 55, say you give up half of yeah, that. 11 million euros. Half of 55 is 25, 27, 27 million euros, 27.5 million euros. Um, but then if that partner helps you grow the business, then your half is going to get a lot closer to, to those 55 million right and yeah. if we get 200 million for it now um i would have voted in favor of that deal i don't know if i would have fav- voted in favor of the tv deals but mm-hmm. the blm with the explanation that the club gave me um i i was quite confident it's funny you mentioned japan because obviously we uh lost a huge opportunity because we were sponsored by uh Rakuten. Rakuten, yeah. and Rakuten is uh, basically japan's amazon mm-hmm. the way i understand it well, yes, but Amazon's a bit more of a, of a, it, anyway, the numbers are not the same, but the purpose is the same. Yes. Yes. But they're in Japan. Right. And we're not. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, I think that deal, I'm not going to, there's no, <laughs> how do I say this? Uh, yes. There is absolutely no excuse for Bartomeu and that deal because it was around for multiple years prior to, I'm just not sure if Rakuten was the right sponsor for the partnership for what Barca was trying to distribute, if you will. Like it just, it didn't, it, and again, this is the, the, the Bartomeu may, like, I mean, you're asking me to blame Bartomeu board again. Like that's easy. That's a layup. I'll do that again. That yeah, that, they didn't, they didn't fulfill what that deal was probably set up to be when they made that partnership. No, but other than that, like, uh, you know, um, it's, it's not just what Rakuten does in Japan. Uh, it's also all of the contacts. Mm-hmm. and connections that you could make through Rakuten in Japan. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, Rakuten is not going to set up a Barca shop. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. But they, have to do but, it. But they, can, they can make it easier for you. Sure. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's a waste of opportunity, but if you're talking about waste of opportunities on a Bartomeu, that's like eighth on the yeah. list. <laughs> yeah. on the mm-hmm. list. So the last yeah. thing here, maybe like two or three minutes on this. So, you know, after this conversation we had, after the assembly, after the meeting, you're right. There were still a lot of unknowns. This could all work out terribly, but, you know, and I would also hope, I, I honestly, like part of me hopes that the club doesn't have 200 million euros burning a hole in their pocket. I don't, I don't want to see that. Like, I'm like, that's exhausting to me thinking about the, yes, it's exciting to have players brought in, but like, I'm nervous. Like I trust Alamani. I trust the board. I trust the board. I trust the people behind the scenes to mm-hmm. a certain extent. But again, 200 million makes me worried. But right, after, yeah. after, after seeing the assembly and hearing the numbers and actually like get kind of almost it was like getting to the bottom of what we can get to the bottom of, not only did it sound like, you know, I, I, it's funny because I was also tagged and stuff from uh, the London is Blue podcast about Kunde, Chelsea rumors, all that stuff. So I was inundated this morning. I woke up with, with tons of notifications from Chelsea fans. And it was interesting to me to hear from other clubs, big clubs, if you will, around the world, like, Barca is now dead. Like they, they're like Barca financially, they've been told that Barca is completely broke. They're dead. They're dead in the water. If anything, you know, I, you and I have been banging this drum for years now saying, Hey, Barca is in worse financial shape than you think they are. We can stop mm-hmm. with Earl and Holland stuff. We can stop at that. But yesterday's assembly, not that it gave me a little hope, but it sounded just, there was a realism to it that it sounds like, okay, I think there is unknown in the future, but it sounds like Kool-Aid's are kind of on the same page of, of, of what, is left to do the tasks, the difficulties, and the road ahead seems much more reasonable. And it's, it's, it just seems a, a little less cloudy than it did even a few weeks ago. Because again, like we're now dealing with real tangible numbers. And if those real tangible numbers come to fruition, Barca is in a good spot. And I also think, again, just the, the, just the fact the assembly existed is, again, is a reminder that Barca does it a different way. There is not some Qatari or Saudi Arabian benefactor who's going to come in and own the club. Like Barcelona are... are Right. Like, and that's, I mean, that's why so many of the people listening to this show and continue to listen to the show when Barca is in a financial ruin, 
when Barcelona missed out on Erlen Holland and misses out on Sadio Mane and whoever else mm-hmm. you want to name. The people who listen to the show are the ones who care about the club for what it represents. And I think if this club is able to, again, if we saw the worst of all of the financial troubles and if, if, if crashing out in the group stage and the Europa League and not and, and, and finishing second far behind the Liga for one season, if that was the worst that's going to happen, along with Messi, obviously, the, the Messi debacle will probably, I think, I'm talking myself out of it already, but the Messi situation will probably be the, th- the stain that lasts on this club the longest, right? Like the way he left, I think that's going to be the one that is just going to, it's because it's a moment in time. You can make up for the other winning, but you can't make up for that day, for that moment in time. Yeah. Um, but, it's, but again, aside from the Messi stuff, like if the result of this season was the worst of Barcelona's troubles, I think, again, so many clubs in the world would sign up for that in a second. Yeah, of course. Of course, it's just a... Fans are so damn entitled. But what, what I worry about is like we, we, we get a lot of money and I worry that all that money is going to make what we need to do more difficult. It's going to make it more difficult mm. uh, for players to accept pay cuts. Uh, whereas previously, maybe we could get Lewandowski for 35 million. Now Bayern is, trying, is going to try to fleece us for 70. 50 or 70, yeah. Because well, then you walk old. away. But then you walk away. Like, you have to. You have I mean, to. yeah, but we have to walk away at 50 or right. 45. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, right. Sure. You know, um, and, and, and the same for any other deal that we might try to make. Um, so but it's, even the it, it's rule, very... Like, even this, this influx of cash does not mean that you then concede to Demelay's demands. I know, like, I no, know... No, no, but you may, may, maybe you a improve bit. it a little bit. Out. Yes, certainly. And, and, and see what he does. Um, because it's still better than... Leeds asking you 60 million for, for Rafinha all of a sudden, right. you know? So, um, so it's a double-edged sword, really. Like if we had money just to survive and not sign, that might still leave us in a better spot one year later. Um, but again, let's, let's see uh, what uh, Laporta and, uh, um, and Alemania do. Yep. Yeah, I mean, yeah. again, it's the core of the team already exists. I, I, I'll say it a million times this summer that if Ansu is healthy, if Pedri is healthy, Gabi continues on, Araujo, Araujo. there is yeah. a team in place right now already, and Barcelona can be very good. So, yep, so I, I'm, yeah. I'm calm about it, calm as they say. So, Lamont, thanks so much. Yeah, last point, last word to you. No, I, 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 I'm just going to take one minute. I have, because you, you mentioned uh, uh, advanced metrics earlier, so, so I have one for you. Um, between Koulibaly and Eric Garcia, um, which one won a greater percentage of aerial duels? I mean, so the obvious answer is Koulibaly, but you're going to tell me the answer is, is Eric Garcia. Is no, that- it's, no, it's Koulibaly. Okay. Obviously, <laughs> but <laughs> of course he did. <laughs> how many percentage points are there between? Oh, between those two? Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna restructure it and say I bet you there is less. I've looked at this before. I think there is less percentage points difference between Koulibaly and Garcia than there is between Araujo and Koulibaly. Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, I was surprised, and I don't watch a Syria uh, Italian football that much. Um, but, uh, you know, Koulibaly is, is a huge guy. Mm-hmm. Like he's tall and, 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 and he's strong. Mm-hmm. Um, I did not expect him to uh, win 59% uh, of his headers um, compared to Eric Garcia's 56. Mm-hmm. And isn't Araujo in the 70s somewhere? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Araujo is like seven, 73. Yeah. Right. yeah, yeah. It was, it was fun. Yeah. Like looking at the Kunde stuff, it was fun just reminding myself that Araujo's defensive metrics are like, our, our, real, our, our top, like top 99th percentile. That's what we're talking about. Like yeah. that is how good he is defensively. He is not dribble yeah. past. He's top no. like four in the world in that. He was aerial duels or I think he's seven or eight or something. Like, yeah, no, he's, he's, a, he's, a, he, he's amazing and he's still going to improve. Um, but what I think would be interesting about Koundé if we play a three-man, uh, three-man defense and he plays mm-hmm. on the right side of that three-man defense. Yeah. Like that could be very interesting. But... But, I mean, we'll it also makes it also makes a right back not to say non essential, but Dest is. I, I've said this. Dest will probably be a backup right winger then next season because there's three at the back. They consider Dest a winger now moving forward as just a backup winger. Or if they play for the back, he's an option. Exactly. There. But yeah. Or or Chavi will switch between three and four. Right. That, that, that I think is more likely. I don't see him as a winger. 
Sure. But because Araujo and Kunde will both be capable of playing right back, we saw Araujo do it this season. Kunde's done it before. Because mm-hmm. those guys are capable of doing that, yeah, they're either the right center backs. And we we have seen as, you know, that sweeper, if you will, Araujo has played that position before. So, yeah. yeah. So certainly you have two very, very, very good passing center backs in Kunde and Garcia, who are very high in those metrics. And then you have Araujo behind them. That's, to me, feels stable. And regardless of what you have in front of it, uh, I mean, not to say that that doesn't mean that Busquets doesn't have to do the same job, but I think with those three at the back, you know, I think you might get away with a little bit more of not necessarily needing all of what Busquets gives you from that position. But again, that, those are discussions to be had if Kunde signs or something like that, which I think you know, we're still a few weeks away from that. Again, these deals still have to be, now that they've been approved, they actually have to be set in motion. You can't- That have to be made. Yeah. It's been made, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that, that, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of people on Twitter saying, uh, uh, applauding uh, Laporta for um, for already making the deal, but the deal is not made yet. Right. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. And you know who, I, and you know that the potential companies and candidates that they could make these deals with were watching that assembly, <laughs> you know, and hearing the numbers that Laporta was throwing out there, but I don't Obviously. think that will change the negotiations yeah. too much. But 